Welcome everyone. I am Mark Zuckerman, president of the Century Foundation. For those of you not familiar with TCF, we are a progressive independent think tank that drives policy change to make people's lives better. We pursue economic, racial, and gender equity in education, healthcare, and work. For decades, we've been the leader in school integration movement, developing research that demonstrates the many benefits of diverse classrooms and helping steer the national conversation in both policy and advocacy circles. That's why we are so happy and excited to be launching the Bridges Collaborative, which has been many years in the making and is led by TCF fellow, Stefan Lallinger. Bridges will fill a needed gap in, in the school integration movement, bringing together local leaders from across the country, allowing them to learn from one another and strengthen their efforts. It is truly a case where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, Secretary John King. Secretary King secured millions of dollars for integration efforts when he was the State Commissioner of Education in New York and as Secretary of Education in Washington, DC. He is one of the nation's leading advocates for school diversity and integration. He is President and CEO of Education Trust, and he's a board member of the Century Foundation. He holds a Bachelor of Arts of, from gov of Government from Harvard University, a JD from Yale, and a Master's and a Doctorate in Education from the Teachers College at Columbia University. Secretary King, thank you so much for being such a remarkable lifelong advocate for the nation's schools, children, parents, and teachers. And we're thrilled to have you here today. Thank you, sir. Secretary King, I want to reiterate uh, our thanks and our gratitude for having you here today. Uh, we're just so excited and we're so honored by your presence. And the way that this is going to work today is we are going to, uh, we're going to ask you some questions and, uh, and we're going to give you the opportunity to respond. And we've got some questions from our members as well at the Bridges Collaborative that we'd love to ask you as well. So looking forward, for, looking forward to a really dynamic and engaging conversation. But just to get us kicked off, Secretary King, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about how you grew up, what your housing and, and education in your schools were like vis-a-vis uh, -vis segregation or integration and what that experience was like for you and how it sort of shaped the way you think about these issues today. Sure. Well, thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this conversation and certainly appreciate your leadership and, and Mark's phenomenal leadership at Century. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in New York City in Brooklyn. Both my parents were New York City public school educators. Uh, my dad was African American, my mom uh, Puerto Rican. And my experience in school was I had the, the good fortune to go to a integrated elementary school, PS 276 in Canarsie. Uh, the school had a um, gifted and talented program that was designed to produce uh, greater integration of the school. Uh, I was fortunate to, to have diverse classmates um, and to have an experience in school that was crucial for me during a really difficult period. Uh, my mom passed when I was eight. Um, I live with my dad, who was quite sick with undiagnosed Alzheimer's. He passed when I was 12. And so those years at PS 276 were so critical. I had just a series of amazing New York City public school teachers who made school safe, compelling, engaging, supportive, nurturing. Uh, and that made all the difference for me as a kid. Um, I went on to Mark Twain Junior High School in, in Coney Island. Uh, which was a um, exam school, but it was an exam school where there had been litigation to require them to intentionally integrate the school. And so again, I was fortunate to have uh, an integrated school experience and a diversity of teachers as well. Um, and I can recall my seventh grade teacher, Miss D, she was the first African-American woman I'd had as a teacher. And during a really difficult period when my dad was really sick, um, you know, it was really hard sometimes in class to focus on school, but in Miss D's social studies class, I was totally focused on being the best Aztec sportscaster there had ever been in our project uh, studying the history of the Aztecs. And so I just, 
you know, I think about her a lot and, and just the difference it made for me as a kid to have just this incredibly positive role model and force in, in my life. And so I, I've always understood that school can have a transformative impact in kids' lives. And I've also always understood that there are tremendous advantages to diverse educational settings for students. Well, thank you for sharing that. It's a very uh, moving and, and compelling upbringing and story. And I think we all have that teacher, uh, it, it, you know, who, who, who is that person for us. So that certainly all resonates with us. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I was wondering if you could shed some light on um, you know, uh, Richard Kallenberg, who opened us up here, said that he noted that he felt like uh, this was sort of an unprecedented time to be able to, to push this issue forward, the issue of school integration. Can you sort of shed some light for us on how the landscape uh, has or maybe has not changed over the last couple of decades in relation to school integration? Yeah, well, it's, it's worth maybe situating the conversation a little bit in the history, right? So we, you know, Unfortunately, oftentimes kids are taught Brown versus Board of Education as though that settled the issue of, of school segregation. Uh, I was a high school social studies teacher and, and I, I think often about uh, high school classrooms where kids are taught to memorize Brown and that was the case that ended school segregation is often the message. But the truth is, as we all know, that's not the case. Uh, the court said, um, separate schools were inherently unequal, but that did not then translate, uh, obviously, into fully integrated schooling. Now, we had important fights over the 20 years that followed. Uh, there was tremendous leadership from the civil rights community, from courageous lawyers, um, and courageous elected officials. And the result was, over that uh, next 20 years, there was a lot of resistance, but much of that resistance was overcome, at least in some places. And we did see progress towards more integrated schooling all the way through um, the 70s. And then we had some very unfortunate, problematic, mistakenly decided Supreme Court cases, including Milliken, um, which narrowed the options for school integration, preventing um, us from looking at the suburban communities as part of uh, metropolitan or regional integration solutions. And then we had the Reagan administration dismantle the role of the Justice Department in pursuing school integration cases. So you had then the sort of uh, disappointing loss of momentum. And what you see is that you had this steady progress in school integration and steady progress actually in, in some gap closing. Um, particularly for African-American students. Um, but then that stalled in the 80s. And we had this long period where we were moving towards greater segregation. And today we know there are places around the country that are more segregated even than, than they were five, 10 years ago. What's different now in this moment is I think we are going through this important, long overdue national reckoning with issues of race. Um, you know, that, that's not a new thing, but the conversation around police violence, I think, has sparked a broader conversation about the role of systemic racism, about our history of 400 plus years of anti-Blackness, and a movement that is multiracial and multi-generational to try to dismantle that systemic racism. And in that context, I think we have an opportunity. Uh, we tried at the end of the Obama administration to advance um, a proposal to Congress to put uh, $120 million towards school integration efforts. Um, that was something Congress did not act on. We had a pilot program that we created with some flexible dollars. Many districts, including some in this room, applied for those uh, planning grants for integration. And that was the first program that Betsy DeVos eliminated, actually sent the money back to the Treasury. So, we had a window at the end of the Obama administration where we we're trying to advance this. Uh, but now I think with this national conversation about racial justice, we have a new opportunity. And the polling data suggests that there is actually a lot of enthusiasm among parents for integrated options. The, the challenge for all of us in this room is how do we translate that enthusiasm into action? How do we create the policy environment necessary to advance school integration? 
Thank you. I mean, that what great framing. And I think that enthusiasm is really shared by a lot of our members in the room uh, who come from 22 different states and 56 organizations and not just school organizations, but also housing organizations, folks who are fighting for more integrated neighborhoods because we know that about three quarters of our public school kids go to school based on where they live. So this is housing plus education. Uh, and that's really the crux of what we're trying to do here. So my next question to you is, you know, you sort of told us about the federal landscape and what some of these broader policies are. But we're in a room full of folks, uh, you know, mostly practitioners, leaders in, in, in education and housing in places across the country who want to know, like, what are some concrete things? What are the most promising practices uh, that districts and housing organizations and localities across the country can do to promote integration in our schools and in our neighborhoods. So if you could shed some light on, on your ideas on that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, wor it's worth saying, as, as you raise the important intersection of education and housing, that we, we've also seen, unfortunately, in the current administration backtracking on, again, some of the progress we were making, for example, the Obama administration on housing integration. There was a proposed affirmatively furthering fair housing rule under the uh, Fair Housing Act of 1968. And that rule has now been rolled back by the, by the Trump administration. That's a missed opportunity to use federal housing policy to try to get communities to take a hard look at issues of segregation and address them in their, in their uh, housing plans. That said, state and local leaders, I think have a lot of opportunities. I mean, one question is how are you using your uh, state education dollars to incentivize school integration. When I was a state commissioner, we used actually some uh, Title I school improvement dollars to try to incentivize districts uh, to undertake integration efforts, even partnerships of districts to, to undertake integration efforts. Uh, state education agencies could use their Title I and school improvement dollars in that way. They could use their state dollars to try to create incentives to create integrated programs that would draw students from across multiple geographies, multiple neighborhoods. So you can imagine a, a Montessori school, a STEM magnet, uh, art school. I, you know, I often think about the DC art school uh, that people are so excited to go to. They, even though they live in the affluent suburbs, they lie and say they live in Washington, DC in order to be able to get into the art school. And, and obviously that's wrong, but it also suggests that the opportunity to go to an art school can be so compelling that people will cross district lines to do so. So states could incentivize those kind of uh, programs across neighborhoods, even across districts. Career and technical education is another opportunity. In some parts of the country, it's regional career and tech ed programs that serve multiple districts that are among the most racially and socioeconomically integrated school opportunities. So states could be thinking in those terms. The districts could be thinking about school design questions. And where do they physically site the school building? So that you might, you know, there's a big difference if you're gonna build a, a school building, if you build it on the border between two neighborhoods that maybe are segregated versus building it deep into one neighborhood where it will feel less accessible to the, to the other neighborhood. So you, you can make, decisions about school siting, you can make decisions about program siting, where does the new uh, dual enrollment program go, and how might that be used to attract students across different lines. Uh, you could be thinking in terms of partnerships with neighboring districts. From a housing standpoint, the question of where you site um, affordable housing can either foster or divide, foster integration or divide folks further. Uh, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland. Montgomery County has a long history of intentional integrated housing. Uh, so you have, I live on a street where there are a number of private family homes, but, uh, but at the end of our street are uh, several small housing developments. Uh, and the result is we have a racially and socioeconomically integrated neighborhood. Uh, so there are those opportunities. There are opportunities to think about uh, helping low-income families access uh, uh, opportunity neighborhoods. I think about the work that's happening in Seattle, work that's happening in the Baltimore region, where families are being uh, aided in their use of Section 8 dollars 
to get into neighborhoods where there are better opportunities. And what we're seeing in those programs is better outcomes for the young people whose families have those opportunities. So we could be intentional about how we use uh, those Section 8 dollars to try to help families get access uh, to more diverse schools. So there's a lot that can happen at the state and local level. I, I wish we had federal leadership, uh, but we don't have to wait for federal leadership. That's a really great message. Uh, you know, in the absence of federal leadership on this issue, you don't have to wait. There are things that you can do. You know, I was chuckling earlier. I, I think that image of uh, wealthy suburban families uh, lying about their addresses to get into a, into an urban school is, you know, we've, re we've really seen it all at this point. Uh, but I was also chuckling because, and smiling to myself, because all of these things that you described, Secretary King, you know, thinking about where you cite your school, uh, thinking about uh, 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 housing and the way housing works in, in local areas. These are all things that are represented having art schools in Montessori. In our, in our uh, group of 56 individual uh, organizations here, they're all represented here and that's part of the power of us bringing them together is for folks to be able to, to learn from one another. Uh, and that's what I think makes this, this group so powerful. I want to not just focus on all of the you know, positive things and, and all the wonderful things about uh, about school integration, because you and I both know the research and we know that it is what is best for kids. There are also a lot of obstacles out there that I don't want us to ignore. Um, what do you think are in 2020 the biggest obstacles to promoting diverse schools, classrooms, and neighborhoods uh, that are real obstacles, not just sort of these uh, things from the past that are, are specters that loom in the distance? Maybe some of those still are real obstacles, but what are the most important obstacles for us to consider uh, to integration in 2020? Yeah, I mean, they, they range, such an important question, and they range from the very practical to the much more uh, philosophical and cultural. I think from a very practical standpoint, transportation is often a significant obstacle uh, because people can't access the school that is outside of their neighborhood either because transportation is not subsidized or because the school district thinks transportation is too expensive, uh, but transportation can be an, an obstacle to, the, to, those, to creating those integrated opportunities. Um, there's a phenomenon that some folks might refer to as opportunity hoarding, right? Where in order to get into the, the magnet program, you have to know to show up for the special test on the third Saturday of October in the special location and social capital differentiates who is able to take advantage of those opportunities and, and who is not. And we often see that students are left out. When, when I was secretary, we did an investigation of um, a Midwestern district where Latino students were underrepresented in the STEM programs, uh, the specialized STEM programs. And what we found was the information only went home in English. And so if your parents didn't speak English, you, you didn't, you, they didn't know about this opportunity. So there are some of those kind of practical uh, obstacles that sometimes are, uh, sometimes with a nefarious purpose, sometimes with a, with a, with a more uh, accidental occurrence, but either way, we need to remove those kinds of barriers so that folks can access those um, magnet programs, those gifted and talented programs, those specialized arts and STEM programs, career tech ed programs. Um, another obstacle I think that comes up a lot of times is fear, really. Um, fear on the part potentially of a white parent who thinks, well, I don't want my kid to be the only uh, white kid in this school and vice versa. Uh, fear of parents of color who say, well, I don't want my kids to be the only kids of color. In a, in a particular school. And so we've got to be intentional about creating community and creating welcoming communities. Uh, you know, there's the, the RIDES effort based out of, out of Harvard that's focused on how do you ensure that when you have racial diversity in a school, it's actually uh, a positive experience for students. How do you think about curricula that provide windows and mirrors opportunities for students to see themselves reflected? How do you make sure you have a diverse staff so that all kids can see diverse adults? You know, we don't have enough teachers of color as a country. That's an, that's an important area that we need to work on. So there are, again, these sort of practical and then some cultural obstacles, and, and we need to work through those. 
but my my frustration is in too many places people act like these things are all outside of our control and that is not true uh, we can take concrete steps to address them and similarly in the housing context um, you know when we have a lot of gentrifying urban communities around the country well city policymakers have decisions to make about how many affordable units are required when the, that new housing goes up and i'm sure it is easier to just let the developers maximize their profits but the developers have have a need for the ability to build we ought to ask in exchange that they incorporate affordable housing units it's one way we can very intentionally create um, more integrated housing opportunities so true uh, i couldn't agree more and i particularly appreciate you giving a nod to the fact that it's not just enough for us to get you know a diverse group of kids in the same building we have to really pay attention to how all of those students are treated once they're there and if they all have the same sort of access to the, the same types of opportunities um i want to you know you have a really interesting background in that you were, you know, you started in a charter school and were a charter school leader, but you also obviously uh, were, you know, in, in, in districts and you were the commission to state, state commissioner of education in New York. And so you've got this interesting lens of charter school and district. My question is, is really twofold, which is why don't we see more charter schools and district schools working together and collaborating ostensibly? That was really the original purpose uh, of charter schools and what you know advice would you offer to a group here assembled here today where we've got charter leaders and we've got district leaders all coming around the same table so it's, it's sort of a twofer yeah yeah well look I think there's been a lot of um, politics that has divided uh, charters and, and, and district schools and uh, in some states uh, poorly designed charter laws that produce a proliferation of uh, unscrupulous, low-performing, for-profit charters, like Michigan, for example. Uh, those kinds of charter laws, I think, breed a resentment that's justified of charters, because I think in many places in Michigan, charters have been a, a force for ill rather than a force for good. Um, so we need strong charter laws with, with real accountability, uh, high bar to get a charter, rigorous oversight of academics and operations to help ensure that level of trust, uh, that these are schools that are serving the public interest. Now, when you have that context, then I think we need to do more to foster those opportunities for collaboration. My experience is when you put teachers, when you put math teachers in a room together, they wanna to talk about teaching math. And when you put social studies teachers in a the room, they wanna talk about how to get their kids excited about history and how to get their kids civically engaged. Uh, when you put science teachers in room, they want to talk about science experiments and how they're getting kids excited about becoming future uh, scientists and pursuing STEM careers. So I think uh, creating opportunities for teachers and principals to collaborate around teaching and learning, around school culture, around thinking about culturally responsive teaching, and uh, those can create those kind of opportunities for organic collaboration. I also think charter authorizers need to uh, see part of their role as fostering the creation of diverse by design schools. Uh, that should be true in the charter sector. It should be true also in, when you have these district kind of new schools offices or small schools offices. They should be thinking about part of the innovation agenda being the creation of diverse by design schools. And there are certainly some of those and, and some represent in this room and certain some around the country. But it's disappointing that we don't see more of those diverse by design charter efforts. The last thing I just acknowledge, and I sort of struggled with this as a charter leader. You know, I, I led a school in Roxbury, the historically uh, African American and now African American Latino section, uh, the city of Boston. And in my community, uh, where my school was and where I lived, less than 10% of adults had college degrees. And the school had as its mission, preparing students to enter, succeed, and graduate from college. We were a middle school with a college prep mission. And I, I really struggled with how to think about student recruitment. 
all of our students were, um, with one exception over my time as principal, uh, all of our students were uh, black or Latino and almost all uh, low income. And we were creating an opportunity for students that they otherwise didn't have. And sometimes folks would say to me, well, why don't you go to uh, the more gentrified parts of the community and recruit upper income white students? And I just struggled with, well, there's so few opportunities, college prep opportunities for students. And we're trying to serve low income families that have a, a desperate need for these opportunities. And I was worried about giving up a seat for a vulnerable student to a student who otherwise would have plenty of opportunities. And I think that's a real dilemma that school leaders face that can be solved systemically. So I, you know, as I moved into more system level roles, I was very conscious of trying to, to create a policy environment in which schools are integrated more broadly. So it's not the individual school leader who's struggling with, with what is, I think, a really challenging dilemma. Thank you for shedding light on that. I know there are a lot of leaders that I've personally talked to who struggle with that very, very issue. Um, look, we're about to, we're gonna enter a segment where we're gonna have a little fun with you, Secretary King. You look like somebody who's fun loving. We're gonna see, uh, we're gonna see what you got. Uh, before we do that, I have one more question in this segment. And that is, you know, we're, this is a, a, a non-political, a non-partisan organization. We're not, you know, we don't endorse any parties, but we are, uh, you know, very keenly attuned to the political landscape because it has such implications for what we're able to do, as you mentioned earlier. So we've really sort of seen what the current administration's track record on school integration is and the conditions it sets. But hypothetically speaking, uh, if there is a Biden administration in the coming years, do you have some idea for what folks who are pushing school integration and diversity might expect from such an administration? Well, look, I think it partly depends on what happens in Congress as well and what the congressional landscape looks like. Uh, as you know, uh, Senator Murphy, Congresswoman Fudge have uh, a Strength and Diversity Act, which builds on the proposal that we put forth at the end of the Obama administration around funding for school integration. That's a bill that uh, Sen Senator Harris supported. Uh, I think that is a bill that could very well move forward um, in, in a new administration with a new Congress. Uh, that would create a new funding stream for school integration efforts. Uh, there was guidance that we put out in the Obama administration on how districts could use race under current law to advance school integration. Um, that guidance was rescinded by the current administration. I think there's an opportunity for that guidance to be put back in place or even to be codified in law. Uh, there's an opportunity if there's a significant new investment in uh, Title I, which um, a number of folks who are running for Congress have talked about, uh, as well as it's been a topic in the presidential campaign. Uh, if there's a lot of new Title I dollars, I think it'll be important for advocates to insist that those dollars be allocated in a way that could be integration advancing and to ensure that the design of those new dollars uh, addresses integration. I also think there's an opportunity on the higher ed side for funding that would be targeted to diversify the teaching profession, which again, I think is an important part of this school diversity topic. We've got to think about how do we make sure that even in schools that are largely serving white students, they have teachers of color because I think it's important for those young people to see uh, educators of color leading in their schools and communities. And then on the housing side, you know, look, we're facing a huge crisis as a country because of COVID-19 and the related economic crisis. Uh, real fear, I have a real fear as I'm sure many in the room do around uh, evictions and the potential that we could have a huge spike in evictions. Um, so we're gonna need federal relief, uh, whoever wins the election. I think there's gonna be a lot of pressure for federal relief to address evictions, but we ought to be thinking more broadly about how do we develop more affordable housing and how do we do that in a way that fosters racial and socioeconomic integration. And that, that is, I think, an important national conversation that could be opened up with a new stimulus package 
addressing the immediate crisis around evictions, but then broadening the conversation to the desperate need for more affordable housing options. Fantastic. All right, this next segment, Secretary King, is it's rapid fire, it's trivia. You know, we've got 56 organizations out there as part of the Bridges Collaborative, and they want to know how well you know their uh, lo local communities. So we, you know, we put some questions to the test. They're multiple choice, and here's the deal, okay? I have a $100 gift card to donors choose, and if you, sir, can get four out of these eight questions right, I'm going to give it to you to then give to uh, a lucky teacher out there. And I okay. actually, I, I think this is kind of funny because, you know, if I were a teacher and I saw that the secretary of education, the former secretary of education gave me money, I would probably feel some, some pressure to make sure that project goes really well. So I, you know, I have a personal stake in this as well. I really want you to do well, but you got to get four out of these eight questions for me to, uh, to bestow this card to you. Okay. So here we go. And for our, uh, our members who are joining us in the Avenium and the website and the conference platform, you'll be able to test your knowledge as well. You're going to have these questions pop up as polls as well. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, question number one, Junior Mints, you may be familiar. These are uh, a candy mm -hmm. that you will have seen in your local convenience store. Um, were first made and still continue to be made in the city of this Bridges Collaborative School District. Is that city... Uh, the, the city where Oakland Public Schools is, A, B, the city where Cambridge Public Schools is, or C, the city where Dallas ISD is, Junior Mints. What is your guess? Wow. Junior Mints. <sighs> Dallas? That is incorrect, sir. The correct answer is Cambridge. So, Mr. Secretary, you is are- that right? Wow. Cambridge. Cambridge. <laughs> Question two. Okay. The county where this Bridges Collaborative Housing Organization is located has a population larger than eight U.S. states. Is it A, Housing NOLA based in New Orleans? Is it B, Good Shepherd Housing based in Fairfax, Virginia? Or is it C, Elm City Communities based in New Haven, Connecticut? Fairfax, Virginia? That is correct, sir. All right, you got one. You're one for two. You need three more here. All right, question number three. This organization's city is home to the largest children's museum in the world. Is it A, Enroll Indy, which is based in Indianapolis, B, Jefferson County Public Schools, which is based in Louisville, Kentucky, or C, Yu Ming Charter School, which is based in Oakland, California. Largest children's museum in the world. Wow, I do not know. I'm gonna go with Indianapolis. That is correct, well done. All wow, right, wow. Number three. Wow. You need two more. Uh, question, uh, these are tough, right? <laughs> they are, they are. Question number four. So now we're, we're back into a little bit of your wheelhouse here. So this is about uh, segregation. Despite a court ordered, uh, court -ordered desegregation uh, and an inter-district transfer program, this collaborative member city schools are as segregated in 2020 as they were in 1965. Is it A, Roaring Fork School District in Colorado? Is it B, Miami-Dade Public Schools in Florida? Or is it C, Milwaukee Public Schools in Wisconsin? I'm gonna go with Milwaukee. And you would be correct. Milwaukee Public Schools both had a DSEG order and an inter-district transfer program. And the latest statistics show that they are as segregated today as they were in 1965. Three out of four, this is pretty good, uh, Mr. Secretary. We, maybe we should have raised the bar a little bit. Uh, next question. This organization city's residents eat out more times per week than any other city in America, but simultaneously one in four children here struggle with hunger on a sad note. So they eat out more than any other city, but also one in four kids goes without. Uh, so a, a stark contrast there. Is it um, A, Larchmont Charter Schools, B, NestQuest Houston, or C, Blackstone Valley Prep? Which of those organizations cities eats out more than any other city and has a hunger problem. Now, where, where is Larchmont located? Uh, LA, Los Angeles. I'm, 
I'm going to go with LA. Incorrect. The correct answer is Houston, Texas. That would be Nest Quest Houston. Really? Uh, oh. there. All right. So we're three out of five. Are you getting nervous? There's just a couple left. I am nervous. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question. The frozen margarita machine was invented in this Bridges Collaborative member city. A, Lycée Francais in New Orleans, B, Dallas ISD, or C, Hamden School District, which is in Connecticut. Frozen mm -hmm. margarita machine. I mean, you kind of got to go with New Orleans on that, right? Or is it a trick? I don't know. I mean, you tell me, sir. Final answer. I'm, I'm going to go with New Orleans. Is incorrect. Dallas ISD. Dallas is the home of the frozen margarita machine. Yeah, right. Wow. Huh. So you need you need you need one more, and you got two questions left, sir. Wow. Wow. Okay. Beyonce shot a video in this charter school building's cafeteria. A. Brooklyn Compass Charter School. B. High Tech High in California. Or C. Kip Beyond in Manhattan. Wow. Huh. I mean, given Jay-Z, I'm going to go with, with Brooklyn Compass. Well done. That is correct. So there's a trick in there. The KIPP school has not yet started, so that would have been quite difficult. Okay. And, uh, and yes, you're correct. Brooklyn, good context. Very well done. You got it. We're going to ask you the last question anyway, but I'm going to go ahead and, 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 and remit your $100. Perfect. Thank you. I'm glad for that teacher. That's good. You're a lucky teacher. And then I want you to tell me who you gave it to, because I, I would love to watch <laughs> uh, what they're up to. The last question is, this Bridges organization's county contains more than 30 islands. A, Oakland Unified, B, Metco, C, Montgomery Public Schools. 30 islands? That's right. Huh. Guess I'll go with Metco. No, sir. It is your own home county of Montgomery Public Schools. So, you know, I don't know. They got to show you where those islands are. I'm not quite sure where they 30 are. 30 islands. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. But let's give it up for John King, who got uh four out of eight questions right and has won our prize so we'll connect later on that we have a few more minutes here and we've got some questions from our collaborative members and i'm going to ask you um because we're limited on time to try and keep the answers quick and short so we can get to as many member questions as we can so the first question is comes from uh mike chalupa who is part of uh, city neighbors charter school in, in baltimore and he asks do you think the ever increasing reliance on standardized testing to measure student success in school qualities of after almost 20 years of no child left behind promotes or hinders equity more broadly and school integration? So a question about assessment and the way that we've done it. Uh, could you answer that as quickly as possible? Yeah. Uh, well, my hope is that with the Every Student Succeeds Act, which President Obama signed in, in December of 2015, that we have in important ways kind of broaden the definition of educational excellence beyond the NCLB criteria. So NCLB focus on English, math, and high school graduation. And what ESSA made possible is the consideration of a broader set of indicators around access to advanced coursework and post-secondary success and science and social studies and so forth. So states have taken different approaches. So I think that's created some opportunity to, to broaden that definition. I still think we need information each year about how kids are doing as a way uh, to hold ourselves accountable for getting resources to the highest need students. So we need, we need that disaggregated data on performance, um, but it's sort of necessary, not sufficient. Um, okay. For a lot of effort. sense. On that question, uh, sorry, did I cut you off there? No, 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 that's good. Uh, on that question, you know, you said data is important. We need data. There's another related question from one of our members. This comes from Hannah Mannion of NestQuest Houston, who wants to know uh, what your opinion on school ranking systems is for K-12. So obviously in higher ed, there's, you know, U.S. News and where we have ways of ranking schools in K-12. Helpful or a hindrance? What's your opinion on those systems? 
Yeah, it's a, sort of a question of what's the purpose. I guess what for me matters most is that we are getting the resources to the places that need the greatest support. So if you have a school, sadly we have schools like this where the percentage of students who are able to read on grade level is in the single digits. We got to get more resources there. We got to get more support. We got to have reading specialists. We got to rethink the reading curriculum. We got to rethink the training of teachers. Uh, we got to think about wraparound supports uh, for kids who may be in, in vulnerable uh, families and neighborhoods. But but we can't ignore that and and pretend it's not true. So you know, I, to me, the question is how are we using information about schools' performance relative to each other to make decisions about sort of surging resources to the places with the greatest need. Thank you. The next question comes from Karen Dubois uh, of Elm City Communities, and she asks, uh, too often the discussion about diversity in schools centers around what benefits integration holds for children of color. How do you articulate the value of diversity for white communities and how do you think about what is missing in schools that are predominantly white, uh, that, are, that have predominantly white students and are taught by white educators? So it's kind of a two-part question, like what yeah. is the value proposition to white families about diversity and then what's missing in predominantly white schools? Yeah, well, I think we have, we have a, a, a fair amount of evidence that going to a diverse school for all students translates into more ability to do perspective taking, to see the world from uh, standpoints other than your own. Uh, increases your ability to do effective problem solving. Uh, we know that white students are going to graduate into a world that is diverse. They're going to, in all likelihood, go to higher ed institutions that are diverse or post-secondary training programs that are diverse. They're going to go into a workforce that's diverse. So there's a real kind of college and career advantage to going to a diverse school for white students. There's also a real civic participation advantage. We, we, we all need, you know, uh, John Lewis would say, we, we, we all got here on different ships, but we're in the same boat now, right? And so there, there's a way in which to be an effective participant in our civic life, you need exposure to diversity. You know, when you think about schools that are racially isolated, uh, white schools, I don't think that changes the responsibility to try to prepare kids for a diverse world. So you should be reading Toni Morrison in a school with white kids and white teachers. Uh, you should be studying uh, the history of Reconstruction and the Great Migration and the Harlem Renaissance in a white school with white teachers and white kids because that is part of who we are as Americans. And so uh, I think the, the responsibility remains to try to uh, provide an anti-racist educational experience even in a uh, school that may be racially isolated with only white students and white teachers. Thank you for that. Well, all right, we are close to the end. So I'm just gonna give you some, uh, a moment or two for some concluding remarks. And I wanted to just say one more time how grateful we are to have you here, how grateful we are to have you on our side. And I think on the right side of history uh, in trying to promote more diverse, uh, equitable, integrated schools and neighborhoods. So thank you for taking the time out of your day uh, to spend with us. Uh, as I've said before, you know, you, we've got 250 folks from across the country who are all here because they believe in this uh, and they're leaders in their own communities. And so I just wanted to know if there's any parting words you wanted to leave us with as we embark on these, this next two days of, of learning, um, again, folks in education and housing who are inspired by you. Uh, any parting words for us as we embark on this, this two day journey together? Yeah, well, one, thank you again for the opportunity. I'm, I'm so grateful to have you at the Century Foundation leading this work. I'm so grateful to have this community of practitioners who are committed to this work in education and housing. That's the thing I, I would leave folks with is that uh, to not be, not be, not find the challenges too daunting that you lose your resolve, that we are inheritors of an extraordinary tradition. And folks have been in this fight, um, and you know this from your family history, folks have been in this fight for generations. Um, 
and against much greater odds than we face today. So we, we can look out at the challenges of our current political climate, things like what happened in Charlottesville, uh, the situation with, with, with the threat to the life of the Michigan governor. We can look at those and we can see that we, there are real uh, fractures in our society and real reasons to be worried about the health of our democracy. But we have to remember that we're inheriting a tradition where folks fought for, folks like Thurgood Marshall and, and his team fought for school integration against what, what at the time seemed like insurmountable odds, right? And they were resolute that they could make progress. You think about the legal strategy that Charles Hamilton Houston developed and then passed on to Thurgood Marshall and the way that and there was a chipping away at um, legalized segregation. And there was also the civil rights movement and folks in the street protesting to try to move congressional action. So we have to think in those terms, we have to think what will folks look back and, and see that we did uh, when, they're, when we look ahead 50 years, when they look back at our time, were we doing the things necessary to build a more just future? And so there's gonna be political opposition. There's gonna be financial challenges as a result of COVID. Folks are gonna say, let's worry about school integration stuff after we get through the financial crisis. But what we need to do is stay resolute and determined and try to draw on the spirit of our ancestors who, and predecessors who were in this struggle and it is only because of them that we're all in the seats we're in now, and we, we have an ob obligation to build on that. Wow, uh, powerful words, certainly resonates with me, and, uh, and I know it resonates with our, with our collaborative members here. So thank you one more time. Um, thanks to those who were joining us on the live stream. Uh, this concludes uh, this portion of, of our event. And for those who are at our convening, we are going to take a five minute break um, and we will see you back on the Avenian platform in five minutes. Secretary King, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Take care.